Hey, good morning, church. Thanks for worshiping online with us this morning. Man, we're gonna sing some songs that glorify our God. This first song talks about a God who does great things. I'm thankful that we have a God who's alive, who's victorious, who's reigning on the throne. Come on, why don't you worship with us this morning? We praise you, Lord. We worship you. We lift you on high. Come on, let's sing. Come, let us worship. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what a Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great. We dance, we dance in your freedom. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. Come on, I know. I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things. Come on, tell them today, God, you do. God, you do great things. again hallelujah Every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken to life. Oh Jesus, I say it, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Here in the middle 
is the place where you promise to be I'm not enough unless you come will you meet me here again cuz all I want is all you are will you meet me here again As I walk now through the valley Let your love rise above every fear Like the sun shaping the shadows In my weakness your glory appears I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? I'm not. you come will you meet me here again cause all I want is all you are will you meet me here again not enough I'm not enough unless you come Will you meet me here again? 
It's all I want It's all you want Will you meet me here again? In the darkness we will From heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word For a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
that's our heart's cry today, that we would exalt you and lift you up. Lord, that we would magnify you and lift you above all, all things in our life, all circumstance, all situation, all people. Father, we exalt you. We bless you in this place today. You're worthy of our worship. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We dedicate ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, church, good morning. Thanks so much for worshiping with us together. Good morning, everyone. We hope you're enjoying your weekend so far. Today is Forward and Faith Sunday. We're so grateful for how far we've come with our capital campaign. We've been able to renovate parts of our building and set aside funds for what's next to come for our church. Please join us in the effort to see this campaign come to a finish. If you'd like to give online, visit at calvarydelran.com forward slash giving, give to our church app, or give by text to 856-393-2340. Be sure to use the keyword forward for all electronic giving. Since the dawn of time, man has sought a touch from heaven, only to fall away again and again. Yet in every age, men have risen up and called us back with one hope to see mankind unite in the spirit of prayer and revival and commune with God once again. These great men recognized our fallen state and called us to humility that leads to repentance, confession that brings forgiveness, and prayer for God's mighty hand of favor and protection. In 1857, God used an ordinary clothing salesman named Jeremiah Lampier. In a small room in the heart of New York City, he invited others to simply pray for one hour. At noon on September 23rd, Jeremiah started on his knees, alone. By the end of the hour, he had been joined by five more men. That was the beginning of the Layman's Prayer Revival. In a few short months, meetings had sprung up all around, with daily attendance growing to 10,000 Today, our nation is nearly as divided as it was then, just prior to the Civil War. Our one hope is to gather pastors and Christian leaders to stand united to awaken our churches, communities, and our nation once again through the power of prayer. You may have heard about a national and global day of prayer and repentance called The Return which is scheduled for September 26, 2020. This event will be live streamed from the National Mall in Washington, D.C. The return is more than just a one-day event. In fact, there is a 10-day prayer emphasis and Calvary Church is excited to participate from our own church and homes. We are currently looking for host homes and prayer leaders for community prayer meetings between the dates of September 18th through the 28th. If you'd like to sign up to either host or lead prayer, visit the link posted below in our comment section. Looking to grow in your faith this summer? It's so good to see you join us either in person or on our Zoom calls. Feel free to attend Wednesday at 7 p.m. The Zoom link can be found on our website or in your weekly email. If you plan on attending in person, don't forget to wear a mask. Youth will continue to meet next door at Pastor Chris's house at 7 p.m. We truly hope that you've been able to enjoy your summer so far and we want to let you know that we've been praying for you all to remain safe, spiritually connected and cared for. If you have a need, we encourage you to fill out an online connect card to let us know how we can help. We hope you have a great week.
Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming and joining you today on Church Online here at Calvary Church. We're glad that you've tuned in again today. We're going to study again in Daniel, that great book that we've been going through. I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have. We're jumping into Daniel 6 today. And let me start by asking you this. If I could tell you how to prosper, truly prosper in this generation and in this culture, how to really be honored among people of authority, how to find favor and really be blessed in a very positive way, and not just that, but truly influence this culture in a positive way, would you be interested at all in that kind of a study? That's what Daniel chapter 6 really helps us to see and understand today. In Daniel chapter 6, the very last verse of that chapter simply says this, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. That is an amazing statement when you put it in the cultural context in which it was happened. Daniel was a Jewish captive slave. He was from a conquered territory. He had absolutely no social standing of any kind. His family had no social standing. In fact, he had been ripped from his family in Jerusalem and transferred all the way to Babylon from his home country. He had no cultural advantage. He had no cultural connections, no socioeconomic advantage of any kind. He was a foreigner in a hostile pagan society, but he prospered and he influenced that culture in a positive way throughout his entire life. Amazing. Even when the kingdoms changed from Babylon to Medo-Persia, even when the kings changed, even when leadership changed, throughout his life for more than 70 years, Daniel continued to be promoted and prospered and influenced the culture despite the fact that he was a Jew, despite the fact that uh, he had no advantage of any kind, Daniel prospered and influenced the culture. Wow. What a tremendous example for you and I. And if Daniel can prosper as a captive slave in Babylon, then you and I can certainly prosper and influence our culture positively in America today, no matter how bad it may seem or what's going on in our life. If you and I will look at the example and follow the example of Daniel, you and I will be able to do the same. So how did he do it? How did Daniel be able to prosper in an environment where he had no advantage of any kind? Well, number one, Daniel distinguished himself. He distinguished himself. It says in verse 1 of chapter 6, it pleased the king, Darius, to appoint 120 satraps, which that's a weird word for you and me. So we're just going to say governors because that's basically what it means. So the king appoints 120 governors to rule throughout the kingdom. And he also appointed three administrators or overseers over those governors, one of whom, one of the three, was Daniel. And the governors were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer any loss, not suffer any loss territorially. So the governors were scattered out around the, the kingdom and they would report and would make sure everything was at peace and being controlled and he would suffer no loss in taxes or money. They were there to govern for the king. It was all about the king and his kingdom. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself, it says in verse 3, among the administrators and the governors by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Daniel distinguished himself. What does it mean to distinguish something? To distinguish means to make oneself prominent or worthy of respect through one's behavior or achievements. Daniel made himself prominent. How did he do that? Well, he didn't do it by self-promotion. He didn't do it through a great ad campaign. He didn't do it by arrogant boasting of his abilities and accomplishments and posting on social media. He didn't do it by uh, developing a great brand. No, he did it by maintaining a right heart, a right spirit, a right attitude toward God and toward the people around him and living a life that others respected him for. He distinguished himself really in three ways, in three areas. Daniel distinguished himself, first of all, through his character. Did you notice what verse 3 said? It said 
He was noticed because of his excellent qualities, not just his skill. He wasn't just a great basketball player. He wasn't just great uh, uh, at accounting or a great salesman or wasn't super charismatic necessarily. That's not what the Scripture says. But he says he was excellent in his qualities, not just his intelligence, his performance, but his character and his attitudes. Literally, the text reads like this, Daniel had an excellent spirit, an excellent spirit. Wouldn't you love to be known as a man or a woman who has an excellent spirit? I mean, when people think about, do they say, man, that Jordan, he's just got such an excellent spirit about him. Oh, that Maria, that Hunter, they just, they have such a quality of spirit about them. I, I just admire them. I respect them for the attitude and the character that that, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had that kind of reputation? That's the reputation that Daniel had. How do you prosper in a crazy culture, a pagan culture, this chaotic world that we live in? How do you do it? You distinguish yourself with excellent character. You begin by developing a positive attitude and spirit. Daniel's spirit was so positive and good and moral and right and true that he stood out when he was compared with all of the other officials around him. His spirit was excellent because he was resolutely dedicated to the Lord, the title of our series. Daniel was resolute in his commitment to God, resolute in his commitment to the right stuff. And so he really stood out in that particular culture. In the context of an idolatrous, sensual, pagan, crazy culture, Daniel distinguished himself by living an exemplary life with a great attitude of humility and diligence and integrity to be different from the crowd of self-centered, arrogant executives around him. Everybody else was striving for themselves, trying to make themselves look good, making sure their posts on social media were awesome and their ad was great and their pictures were beautiful. Not Daniel. Daniel was concentrating on loving God and being a man of integrity. And because of that, he really stood out. In fact, so much so that when his peers looked at his life and tried to find something wrong in terms of his character and his integrity, they could not find anything whatsoever to accuse him of. Daniel was a man of his word. He was reliable. They could count on him to do what he said he would do, to be what he claimed to be. There was no secret sin in Daniel's life or lack of honesty or little compromises behind the scenes that could be criticized or taken advantage of. Daniel was a man of integrity and liability, positive optimism in a culture of intrigue and deception and manipulation and lying and deception and selfishness. Listen, if you want to distinguish yourself, if you want to see the hand of God's blessing on your life, I would encourage you to do what Daniel did. Be a person of your word Work on integrity. Don't make promises you have no intention of keeping. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Be honest. Be forthright as a person. Develop a grateful, positive, serving attitude. And I guarantee you that will begin to distinguish you in this culture who oftentimes are only looking for what they can get. It's all about themselves, their own pleasures, their own thoughts and ideas. Not with Daniel. He distinguished himself with an exemplary life of integrity and character. You do that, you'll begin to stand out, and people in authority will begin to trust you. They'll begin to look to you. They'll begin to want to promote you because they know that you will do what you say. Uh, That's huge in this culture. But not only through his character, Daniel also distinguished himself just through his work ethic. It says in verse 4, that because of Daniel's excellent spirit and because the king wanted to promote him when the other, when his peers found out, it says, at this, the other administrators and the governors, they tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel. They were jealous. Who is this Jew among us? You know, why is the king promoting this guy? Who is he anyway? He's just one of those foreigners. And they were jealous and they hated Daniel. 
And so they began to look in his conduct in terms of his work. It says that they look for charges in his conduct of his government affairs. In other words, his work. But they were unable to find anything against him. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and he was neither corrupt nor negligent. They tried to find something to accuse Daniel of and his work responsibilities, but couldn't find anything to accuse because of his diligence in that area. Daniel worked hard. He served diligently and faithfully in his responsibilities. He didn't neglect his responsibility. Did you, did you notice that? He wasn't negligent. He didn't let it go. He, he worked hard. He wasn't lazy or half-hearted. He didn't procrastinate. He worked hard and diligently and gave his best effort to a job as a captive in a foreign country. Daniel didn't complain or murmur about the injustices of his life, but he gave his very best to do the job that he had been assigned to do. Wow. You know, one of the best ways you can distinguish yourself in this generation is just be a stinking, good, diligent, faithful employee. Be a hard worker. Do your absolute best in the job that you're assigned to. Maintain a good attitude. Be thankful for what you have rather than complaining and murmuring about what you don't have. Be submissive and supportive to the people who are over you instead of backbiting about them and their decisions. You got a, you got a problem with what they're thinking or saying or how they're leading? Go directly to them and just share your heart with them. And, and here, you may be surprised. They may know something you don't know. Isn't that, isn't that a revelation for us? Hey, be diligent in your work ethic and work hard to serve the other people around you to the best of your ability And you'll begin to distinguish yourself among your peers who are often more interested in doing as little as they can just to get a paycheck rather than as much as they can to serve God, honor God, and bless people who depend on their work. I'd encourage you to work hard. You know, I just want to say real quick that uh, because of a huge donation, we were able to replace our carpet here in the sanctuary uh, because of the generosity of someone. And the workers actually are still here. In fact, they just kind of walk through the room. And I just want to say to them uh, publicly how much I appreciate them and their diligence. Man, they have done an excellent job in putting this carpet in. They were fast. They did it well. It's really a superior work. And so thank you to our, our uh, man who's part of our congregation for your donation and to the excellent workers that you've sent our way. We appreciate you guys so, so much. Well, ultimately, here's the thing. As a follower of Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a Christian today, here's the ultimate reality. You are working not for that boss, you're working for the Lord. You're not working for people, you're working for the Lord. And your work ethic, your diligence in your work, your attitude in it, reflect your faith or your lack of faith in God and his purpose for your life, his mission in placing you where he placed you. You are where you are by the sovereignty of God and his his blessing, his opportunities. He placed you there regardless of how you got there. As a follower of Christ, We don't work for the rewards that people give us. We don't work just for the honor or glory that man may give us. We work for the rewards that God gives us. And if you remember, Jesus said that God sees what's done in secret and he rewards us openly. Oh, I love that. How many hours behind the scenes? How much diligence and faithfulness? We have people in our congregation that work so hard for this church and the mission of the church. You never even see it. They spend hours, a lot of these young adults, uh, some sitting in the room today, have spent hours painting in, a, in the kids' own room and making it look good and giving diligence in their, in their work. Uh, there are people who, who give so much of their time and effort, and they're doing it what? They're doing it in secret in the sense that it's not publicized. We often don't call and say, oh, thank God for the guys cutting the grass or the, the ladies doing the books and keeping take. You know, oftentimes you don't see them. We just see the people on the stage. But listen to me, God sees what's done in secret, and he rewards openly those who are diligent, who take seriously, they're working for him instead of for people. In fact, in Colossians 3, 17, 
The scripture reminds us, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do your work for the Lord and be thankful as you're doing it. Whatever you do, Colossians 3 says, work at it with all your heart as for the Lord and not for men because you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's the Lord Christ you're serving. 1 Corinthians, so whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. You want to distinguish it? You want to prosper in this crazy culture? Ah, be a person of your word. Have integrity. Have an excellent spirit. Work hard. When we realize that God is our real boss, regardless of what we do, that he's our source of promotion, he's our source of increase. When we begin to work with that kind of an attitude, we work with more purpose, we work with hope, knowing that God is watching, he is just and fair, he will reward us according to our faith in him. And if you will work hard and maintain a positive godly attitude, I guarantee you, you will stick out in this culture. Daniel distinguished himself through his character, through his work ethic, and through his uncompromising faith. In verse 5, it says, finally, these men who are so jealous, they, they just wanted to get rid of Daniel. And it says, so finally, they said to themselves, after examining his life, they said, look, this is useless. We're not going to find anything to criticize this guy of unless, verse 5, we will never find any basis of charges against him unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Daniel was so committed to righteousness, so committed to God and consistent in his practice of faith in God that he stood out as a person who truly lived what he said he believed. Oh, when you and I really live what we believe, when we really stick to it, we live a good life. We're not gossiping and slandering and cheating and stealing and lying and and doing things that we know are wrong, but we really are truly trusting God. We begin to stand out. How do you prosper in a pagan culture? Refuse to compromise in your faith and obedience to God. Refuse to cheat and steal and lie. Put God in, refuse to put God in second place. Refuse to treat him as if he is some sort of giant vending machine in the sky just to give you what you want. No, no, no. Seek God. Seek his righteousness. Seek his, his kingdom. Seek his glory. And that will begin to set you apart. That's what Daniel did. And Daniel prospered in that pagan world because he distinguished himself with an exemplary life. And the result was that the king planned to promote him above his peers and make him the chief administrator over the entire kingdom. Oh, that grated against those peers. Daniel prospered because he distinguished himself. However, notice with me that when you distinguish yourself, did you notice this? Everyone is not going to like you. No, 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 no. Don't don't confuse these two. Oh, oftentimes when we obey God, oftentimes when we distinguish ourselves, when we stand out, people are convicted by our life. They don't like us very much because it thwarts some of their manipulative ideas. Everybody's not going to like you. In fact, those other administrators and governors wanted to get rid of Daniel out of jealousy of his success and the favor of the king. They despised his race. They despised his character and probably just convicted by his righteous life because it exposed their sinfulness and their selfishness. And I can guarantee you that that's exactly what will happen to you in this, in this life. Everyone won't like you for doing what's right and speaking the truth. Some people will hate you, ridicule you, uh, uh, come against you, persecute you. But listen, but listen, here's the deal. God will take care of you and you will continue to go forward if you will continue to be resolute in your dedication to the Lord and serving and doing what's right for him. Let me give you an example of that in modern day culture. I like Chick-fil-A. Anybody besides me like Chick-fil-A? I love Chick-fil-A. 
And you know, apparently a whole lot of other people do. Because you know what I've noticed over the last few weeks and months? Every time I go to Chick-fil-A, it doesn't matter what Chick-fil-A I go to, there's a huge line of people always, almost at any time of day. When I go to Chick-fil-A, it's always busy. There's always a lot of business. There's always people pouring money into Chick-fil-A. Now, isn't that interesting when you put it in historical context where a few years ago, Chick-fil-A took a stand on a social issue. They stood on the Word of God, were severely criticized by the media, and told everybody was saying, oh, we need to stand against Chick-fil-A. and they're, They're such hypocrites. They're they're such bigots or whatever, and yet they take off on Sunday. They close on Sunday to honor God. They stood on the Bible and a social issue, and what has happened? God has blessed Chick-fil-A abundantly. Listen, that's how it works. Oh, there may be persecution. People won't like you. You may get slandered, called a lot of names. But when you refuse to compromise your faith and integrity and do the right thing, you will be prospered because God's got your back. So Daniel prospered because he distinguished himself in that generation. Well, finally, these men who hated him so much, they came up with a plan to get rid of Daniel, which, by the way, was actually a huge compliment to Daniel. They knew that Daniel was so committed and such a man of prayer, they knew they could get him there. And so in verse 6, it says this. So the administrators and the governors, they went as a group to the king. They went in solidarity to a few of them who were there. And they said, may King Darius live forever. They're going to really butter him up. They're going to really pour it on. So they say, the royal administrators and the prefects and the governors, the advisors, all of them have agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or any human being during the next 30 days, except you, O your majesty, everybody should pray to you in their minds as as the representation, extension of the gods. Oh, that really made Darius's ego go through the roof as they buttered him up. Issue a decree that anyone who prays to any God or human being during the next 30 days except you, issue the decree that they'll be thrown to the lion's den and destroyed in that. You know, they're just flattering, they're using him, they're manipulating him because they want to get rid of Daniel. And the truth of the matter is, all of the governors hadn't agreed. They're scattered out all the whole kingdom and all the few of them who disliked him. You know, I've noticed that oftentimes. People will come to me sometimes. They'll send me an email, and they'll say, everybody's saying. Everybody, everybody's saying. And when I drill down on that, every time, 99.9% of the time, when I say, well, who's everybody? What's going on? It's usually one, maybe two other people. Everybody is saying, well, everybody in my little circle that agrees with me, that's who's saying. And that's what was going on here. And they come with this, this idea, they butter the king up, they're manipulating him, building his ego, you're, you're like God and we all just want to honor you and, and serve you. And Darius fell for it. In verse 8, it says, Now, your majesty, issue the decree. Put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. And that was, their, that was the way of their government. Once a king put something in writing, he would not or could not, could not in the sense that they would not change it. Why? Because they didn't want to admit they may have made a mistake. They wanted to look like, you know, great. And so they're asking him to put it in, knowing that it can't be repealed. And so it says in verse 9, so King Darius put the decree in writing. He fell for it. Without truly thinking it through, he signed the bill and proclaimed it throughout Babylon in an impulsive moment of flattery. And how did Daniel respond? Well, that brings me to the second point this morning. Daniel disciplined himself when he heard the decree. Verse 10 says this. 
Now, when Daniel learned the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open toward Jerusalem, and three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. He didn't change his routine one bit. He had been praying three times a day consistently. He trusted God throughout his stay, seeking God and calling out to him. Verse 11 says, the men went as a group and they found Daniel praying and asking God for help just as they expected he would because he was so committed and consistent. Huge, huge compliment to Daniel. And these men took advantage of it. But listen, here's the deal. Daniel disciplined himself. He disciplined himself. Can you imagine the feelings? Can you imagine the fear? Can you imagine the realities of, of knowing that if you, if, you do, if you continue to pray, you're going to get thrown to the lions, real lions, not figuratively of speech. This was a punishment they frequently used in those days. And the fear, the apprehension, the reality, the voice of the enemy bombarding Daniel with all the, all the stuff. But Daniel didn't allow the circumstance or his feelings or the pressure of the peers to keep him from seeking God. He disciplined himself to continue to trust God, continue to seek God despite the decree and the pressure to stop praying for 30 days. He didn't compromise in his prayer. He didn't stop praying. He didn't hide somewhere while he was praying. Daniel continued the discipline of prayer just as he always done, refusing to allow his feelings or circumstances or the reality of faith facing death, keep him from honoring God. He knew he needed him more than his own physical life, which is exactly what his enemies were counting on. And so verse 11 says, they went, they found him asking help from God. And verse 12 says, so they went to the king and they spoke to the king about his decree Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human except you, your majesty, didn't you say they would be thrown into the lion's den? And of course, the king has no idea what's going on. And so he says, oh, absolutely, yes, uh, I absolutely did. The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. And then they say this to him. Well, King Daniel who's one of the exiles, one of those slaves, one of those foreigners, those Jews from Judah. Notice how they disdain him. He pays no attention to you, king. He's defying you, your majesty. He's not listening to your decree that you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, the king was greatly distressed and determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort to rescue him until sundown. And they always carried out the uh, sentence at the end of the day on the day it was given. So now King is distressed and he's trying his best to try to figure out what to do to change it so he doesn't lose Daniel. Wow. Not the, reaction, not the reaction those guys expected and not what they were hoping for. The king suddenly realized that he had been used by these men to get rid of the best servant he had, a man he trusted deeply, and it made him angry and sick to his stomach that he had done such a foolish thing, so he did his best to find a way to rescue Daniel without admitting his mistake and reversing the decision. He would have had to humble himself to be able to do that, and he he felt he couldn't for the sake of the integrity of his rule. And isn't it true, dear ones? There's a great contrast here between Darius's actions and Daniel's actions and response. Isn't it true, listen, isn't it true that impulsive decisions will almost always get you in trouble? Listen, when we act impulsively, when we don't think things through, when we don't let it simmer a little bit and seek God and his wisdom and wait, oftentimes, listen to me, dear ones, oftentimes impulsive decisions will have ramifications and consequences that will be much worse than you ever dreamed and can ruin relationships and all of your life. In one moment of impulsive action, 
you can really destroy your life. Don't be impulsive. Discipline your feelings. Discipline your thoughts. Seek God. Wait on God. Listen to God. How do we deal with threats and fears and ridicule and jealousy and gossip and hatred and abuse and challenges, even opportunities? What do we, how do we deal with those things that flatter our ego? You know, just because I get offered something uh, that just makes me feel really good or uh, makes me feel maybe more honored or, wow, cool, you know, uh, just because I have that doesn't mean I should take it. There's always a cost to every decision that we make. If I take on more responsibility, something is going to lack over here. Something's going to get left behind. We got to think through, think not just about how it makes us feel, but what's the end result of making this decision? Who does it affect? What does it affect? What will I have to give up or change in order to do it? Listen, this is critical. So how do we deal with things? Well, we commit ourselves to prayer. We discipline ourselves to wait and pray and seek God rather than panicking and giving into feelings of hurt or rejection or offense or or, or, uh, ego, rather than giving into a poor me, I can't believe this has happened to me, I can't believe God allowed this attitude. No, we, we pray, we discipline ourselves to seek the Lord knowing that God has our back. And this is the key to our strength and prosperity in this generation. Rather than giving in to despair or anger or revenge or, or the need to take control, we get along with God and we seek him knowing that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. He's going to work all things for our good if we will continue to trust him. Daniel disciplined himself to pray. And so in verse 15... The scripture tells us that at the end of the day, the accusers returned to make sure the king carried out his sentence. They weren't going to let him get by with not doing it. And they go back, verse 15, the men went as a group to Darius, and they said to him, remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree that the king issues can be changed. You've got to do this. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den. And just before they're throwing him in, and, and by the way, there's, you can do some research. Uh, there were lion's dens. Uh, they often had a side entrance and a top entrance, so all of this makes sense. This is very historical. So they bring Daniel toward the den, and as they're getting ready, I think, probably before they throw him in, the king says to Daniel, uh, as court of a wish, it's, it's probably all, uh, sort of a bit of a prayer. Uh, you know, he, he knows, he's seen Daniel, he's watched him, and he says this, Daniel... May your God, whom you serve continually, your God whom you serve, what a great reputation. May your God whom you serve continually, may he rescue you. Daniel, I'm sorry. I I didn't realize what I was doing. I wish I hadn't done this. I feel so terrible about this. I'm really sorry. I can't change it. But may your God, may he rescue you. Verse 17, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his signet ring like they would press, you know, into wax or something. And they also sealed it with the nobles' rings. The king sealed it with his to make sure those other guys didn't mess with Daniel. And they sealed with his to make sure the king didn't. So that, according, quote, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Daniel was sealed in. The king returned to his palace, and he spent the night. I, I, I think this is hilarious. I, I, it's hilarious in this sense, the contrast between him and Daniel. So the king spends the night at his palace. He's in a beautiful palace surrounded by luxury and comfort, and he spends the night without eating, without entertainment, and he is distraught. He can't sleep. Have you ever had one of those sleepless nights when you just, you know, your mind, you know, that's, that's what's going on in the king. He was so regretful for what he had done. And at first light, as the dawn is just breaking, literally in the text, as soon as possible, the king runs back over to the lion's den. He's hurrying to get to the den, verse 20. Before he even quite gets all the way there, he starts shouting, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually, has he been able to rescue you from the lions? Are you there, Daniel? I love that. Here is this great king of the greatest empire on earth 
running to see if his captive slave is okay because Daniel had distinguished himself and Daniel had disciplined himself. He was such a good servant, he didn't want to lose him. In verse 21, Daniel answers, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. You see, that's the primary deal. And he says, I've not done any wrong in your sight either, majesty, against you. I've done what's right and God intervened. The king spent the night in agonizing sleeplessness, regret, and Daniel slept like a baby, probably using a lion as a pillow. I love that. Why? Because Daniel trusted God. He committed himself to the just judge of the universe, the king above all kings, and he believed God would do what was right in that circumstance because he had done nothing wrong. And the king, verse 23, was overjoyed. He gave the orders to lift Daniel out, and he lifted him out. And the Bible says there was no wound on him, not even a little scratch, because he trusted his God. And verse 24 goes on to say, but the king commands that the men who falsely accused him, that them and their families be thrown in. And the Bible says that before they hit the floor of the den, the lions were already overpowering and ripping into them. There's a contrast. The writer is helping us to understand the supernatural power and intervention of God into the life of a man who trusted the just judge of the universe. Hallelujah. God intervened. Daniel was supernaturally delivered from lions and spent the night in rest while the king spent the night in regret. Listen, if you'll discipline yourself, you won't have any regrets. When you act impulsively, you let your feelings, your appetites make the decisions for you, you won't prosper, you won't be respected, and you won't be what God wants. Let me quickly, quickly, quickly come to the third point this morning, and that is, how is it, how did, was Daniel able to be rescued? Here it is, point number three, Daniel dedicated himself rather than defending himself. He dedicated himself rather than trying to defend himself. Our natural tendency when we're wronged is to fight, is to defend ourselves. It's to strike back. It's to try to get revenge or make sure the other people get the justice they deserve when we're treated unfairly. But when Daniel was brought to the king, he didn't feverishly cry out or try to defend his actions. Apparently, He didn't argue or fight. He simply willingly and evidently without even saying a word cooperated and went right to the pit and allowed them to put him in. How could he do this? Well, Daniel had dedicated himself fully to the Lord as his judge and the goal of Daniel's life was to please and serve God, not preserve his own physical well-being, believing that God's justice and plan and sovereignty and listen his eternal purpose were more important than his physical life Daniel dedicated himself to the will of God to the protection of God the plan of God believing that God would reward his faith and integrity and in the sovereign plan of God he did he delivered and honored and continued to honor Daniel and he continued to serve even into and on to the next king's In his later years, Daniel is still prospering. When we dedicate ourselves to God's purpose and his plan for our lives, we never have to fear or worry about any threat that comes our way. As Paul said in Philippians, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Does God deliver everyone from the lions? No, there's someone watching this morning that you feel like you've been thrown to the lions. And you feel like the lion's mouths have not been shut. I know this because of prayer this morning and the Holy Spirit putting this in my heart. You feel as if you're being torn from every side and beaten up. But let me just say to you, listen to me. If you will continue to trust God, if you'll continue to turn to him regardless of the injustice, 
regardless of the hurt, regardless of the loss, regardless of the persecution, regardless of the words, whatever's going on, listen, with every crucifixion, there's a resurrection on the other side for the person who trusts in God. With every cross, there is a day of resurrection. For every Good Friday, there's an Easter morning to the person who's trusting in Christ. To live as Christ, to die as gain. Don't give up. Dedicate yourself to the will and plan of God. Honor and serve God. Distinguish yourself. Continue to discipline yourself. And God will not abandon you, and he has not abandoned you. He will be with you and bring you out and help you in your life. Listen, the ultimate prosperity is in the presence of God in eternity. And if you want to truly prosper in this world and in this life, dedicate yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ because the Bible reminds us God cannot be mocked. We will reap what we sow, so keep doing good, it says in that text, because in due time you will reap the blessing of what you are sowing. This is so critical. We see this working out in verse 25. Let me just close by reading these closing verses, verse 25 to 27. King Darius wrote to all the nations, all the peoples and languages within in the empire, and here's what he said to them. May you prosper greatly. Notice the word again. May you prosper greatly. And, and, what, and what was the key? Here it was. He said, I issued a decree, this is a new creed, that every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he's the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in heaven and on the earth. He rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and Cyrus the Persian. So in conclusion this morning, simply you can truly prosper in this pagan world by being a fully resolute, dedicated follower of Christ, distinguishing yourself with a life of character and integrity, disciplining yourself, dedicating yourself to God as your just judge. Because listen, It says on your teaching outline, if you're using it, true prosperity is not measured by money or fame or position or accomplishment. True prosperity is righteousness, integrity, purity, and godly influence that causes a pagan world to realize that Jesus Christ is Lord and he is worthy of their trust and allegiance. If you and I will follow the example of Daniel, God will prosper us and use us to influence this crazy world that we live in. Listen, you're an ambassador of Christ. As a follower of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the light of the world, Jesus said. You're like a city that's on a hill on a dark night if you're really following Christ. You're going to be distinguished. People are going to see it. No matter who you are, no matter what your background, no matter what your race this morning, no matter what your circumstance, Daniel had nothing, nothing at all, no socioeconomic status, no no, uh, racial advantage, nothing. But God prospered him because of the life he lived. I encourage you to live for the Lord and watch what he'll do in your life, if you will. Well, I don't want to pray for you this morning. And Especially, I want to pray for those who feel like you're in the lion's den this morning. But before I do, can I just ask you again this morning, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about intellectually accepting, oh, yeah, Jesus is God. Oh, yeah, I believe that in my mind. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, have you jumped out of the plane of dependence on your own ideas, philosophies, and life? to place full dependence and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to turn away from a lifestyle that's against his teaching, to turn to him alone for your life, for your salvation, for your forgiveness, and for the abundant life that he alone can give. If you haven't today, let me just remind you that God so loved you 
that he gave Jesus so that if you will believe and trust in him, he will give you eternal life and forgiveness and bring the promises and blessing on your life. If that's you, why don't you trust him today? You can text the word follower to let us know. You can give us a call, an email, a text. Let us know that you want to follow Christ. We'll make sure we give you some stuff to help you along the way. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can prosper because you're a just God. And the Lord, the true prosperity is in eternity. That we've got a future before us that cannot be taken away. And that we've got purpose between now and then that our life is about you, and that if we will live for you, thank you, Father, that as you fulfill your purpose for us, we will have the promotions, the, the placement, the blessing, the provisions that we need to do all that you want us to do until it's time for us to step into eternity with you and receive the ultimate prosperity and reward that you have for us. So, Lord, I pray for brothers and sisters this morning. I pray strength and encouragement. I pray for those who feel as if they're in the den this morning being torn apart. Lord, would you let them sense your presence this morning, quicken faith in their soul, give them, Lord, again, a promise from your word and build them up today. Intervene in their behalf, Lord. I pray for miraculous intervention as with Daniel in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you for what you're going to do, and I look forward to the testimonies of your grace. We give you praise. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. Jesus, you don't know me yeah.
just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else nothing else nothing else Jesus nothing else will do to him I just want you I just want you and nothing else come on he loves to hear it and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do Lord that's our prayer this morning God that you and you alone would be our desire Lord Father that we would realize you paid the price you gave it all Lord Lord and the return for our lives is to live it surrendered to you that you're all we need Lord you're our portion you're our sustainer God thank you for every person who's participating who's watching who's joining in this morning Lord I pray that they would realize and know God, you are the only source of satisfaction. You're our hope. You're our desire. You're our delight. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen.